So what is an NFT? And what can NFTs really do? Good afternoon. See, when we talk about NFTs here, I understand that when you're coming in today and you're listening to this word, your minds would be wondering, and I'm pretty sure that some of you have already heard about this word, so you're thinking that uh, all an NFT can do is uh, really represent a digital art, something that maybe would have uh, uh, represented a, uh, a painting, a digital art that might have been sold for more than $69 million. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard about that transaction happen. Or it could be one of those run-of-the-mill shoes which uh, you or I would have, would have paid maybe upwards of $100,000 just to make sure that your avatar looks really, really cool wearing those where? On the metaverse. That's not real. So let's start making some sense here. But for that, you know, we'd like to first uh, take a bit of a time to understand what the technology behind it means. And that's called blockchain. Yeah, again, another speaker, another talk on blockchain. So let's just keep it to a preface, 30 second stops, just to understand what is it that we are talking about today. So what is blockchain? Technically put, it's a combination, a complicated combination of cryptographic hashes, wallets, a melange of consensus protocols, pieces of code called smart contracts deployed on the blockchain in order to offer fundamental characteristics of transparency, immutability, decentralization, anonymity, etc. Yeah, that's probably not the simple explanation, right? All that matters to you or that should matter to you today is that it is immutable. The point is, in simple terms, a blockchain is a ledger where if I'm sending you $1,000, 10 different people would be writing down their transaction so that you cannot go back in time and alter it. That's very unlikely in these centralized ledgers that we have uh, going, running with, uh, say, governments or centralized banks, etc. Right? So that's what a blockchain is all about. I promise, that was the last time I was talking about truly blockchain-y tech jargon today. Let's see if I can be up to that promise today. To be able to understand more of it, of the original question, trying to answer that original question that I asked at the beginning, today we'll be taking a look at two stories. Ajay Singh from India, Kwame from Zimbabwe. They are smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers, marginal farmers are people who have less than two acres of land not very well to do, we'll be taking a look at them. You know what the average income of a farmer household in India, a smallholder farmer household in India is? It's that number. On that, if uh, we are talking about a country in Africa, that's probably around $2,520. Now, this should already start raising some eyebrows because in Mumbai, the average household income is $7,200 around, what, four and a half, five times that number that you're seeing on screen today? So, where is the gap? Let's try to understand that. For that, let's also take a look at a very daunting number, to say the least. The total number of farmers in India who have committed suicides over the last approximately a decade or so has crossed 100,000. Again, that number is approximately three times in a country in Africa. So again, the same thing. Where is the gap? Where are we failing? If they're dealing in a real-world asset, such as crops, what do farmers do? They grow crops. And a crop is fairly liquid in nature. So where is the gap that, on one hand, a population in India, or say Zimbabwe, or any other country, an agri-based country, where they're looking for simple income, where they're looking for the availability of real-time funds, at really low costs. And while on the other hand, we know that the global fintech lending industry has been crossing billions of dollars in total market cap. So again, there is the gap. So how do we try to fill it? How do we make sure that a crop that is that a real world asset, such as uh, crops that is fairly liquid in nature, gets the liquidity that it deserves? To do that, I would have to again introduce a tech jargon to you today still trying to keep that promise, and that jargon is tokenization. 
What is tokenization? We'll keep it to very simple terms. Tokenization is when you take any physical asset, such as metals, crops, crude oil, invoices, exotic assets such as uh, fine art, wine, cigars, and put them on a blockchain. That gets represented with a digital token. Now hold on to that digital token that we are just talking about right now, because you're going to see at the end of it how this digital token is central to everything that we are discussing today. So that's what tokenization is all about. And this market has fairly grown beyond $2 billion over the last two, two and a half years. And what this tokenization can do is bring in this liquidity, the gap that we were trying to fill, that we were talking about filling. So again, how do we do this? To be able to do that, we are working, uh, going to be talking about a blockchain called Ethereum. A blockchain such as Ethereum has, with the help of uh, code deployed called smart contracts deployed across blockchain, uh, the blockchain, has supported use cases more than worth 21,000 in crypto tokens, cryptocurrencies, which is what I guess everyone knows about more, right? People do not really know about blockchain as much as they know about Bitcoin and, and others. Just going back, Bitcoin's white paper was taglined a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now that is what sticks with people's minds. We are looking to speak so much beyond that. So Ethereum has over 21,000 cryptocurrencies. It has over 150 stable coins worth over $135 billion in market cap. And a majority share of that $2 billion tokenization of real world assets that I was talking about earlier. What we are able to do with this is that someone from the comfort of their home, say in Iceland, is able to fa fund Ajay Singh. You remember the farmer, the smallholder farmer from India. This, ladies and gentlemen, is another jargon, which is called decentralized finance, DeFi. I tried sneaking in another jargon here. I hope you're okay with it. Now this decentralized finance is something that people have already started thinking of as the future of financing. What today I would really request all of you to start looking at it is as the future of financial inclusion. Reaching the very grassroots that governments and banks with their strategies and people on the ground have not been able to traditionally reach yet. This is what DeFi can do. Someone in Iceland to someone in India or someone in Africa. This kind of financing, this kind of funding was not possible without such decentralized systems in between. Your banks, even if they were trying to do that, it was not possible for them to do it without SWIFT and all other technologies which cost a lot of money. A farmer, I just told you, is a smallholder farmer, less than two acres of land, less than a household income, less than $1,500, is not in a position to afford that kind of money. So that's what blockchain can really do. When we are talking about NFTs, these NFTs are what are representing such real world assets. And these are being done today. Over the last half a decade, things have changed vastly. These real world assets, when are being represented by NFTs, put on the blockchain, they open up a new world of possibilities completely. These enable people called liquidity providers, let's forget that for a moment, these people can invest into instruments such as bonds, and these bonds represent these underlying assets driving in the kind of liquidity that we need for, to fill that gap. And at the same time, if someone is interested in investing in these bonds, they're able to enjoy steady return of, on interest over completely stable real-world assets. Now that's what an NFT can do. Now that answers your question, the question that I asked earlier. What is an NFT and what can NFTs really do? Over the years, NFTs have come way beyond just a digital art in a wallet. You know what? In India, over the last quite a few years and way back, farmers, smallholder farmers, have been owning NFTs in their pocket. They have been owning their 500 quintals of wheat or their 250 grams, kilograms of maize or rice as NFTs in their pockets. 
And this was way back you or I minted or owned our first NFT, which could have been a digital art in a wallet. The farmers have absolutely no clue, or anyone who's using blockchain at that level has absolutely no clue that they have been an integral part of such use cases which have a very deep impact on how blockchain is used, how blockchain is perceived and which is much more than Bitcoin, which is much more than Ethereum, which is much more than any other cryptocurrency that you've heard. They have no clue that they were a part of such a complicated technology at play, and they were at the forefront of it, but they have used it. They've used it with the government, they've used it with the banks, they've taken loans against it. In India, in Africa, such places where technology, in Africa where technology is, people expect that there's not a lot of technology that we'll see, blockchain is at the heart of it. That's what blockchain, NFTs, tokenization, decentralized finance can really make happen. From in 2008, so 15 years have passed, when we first saw the occurrence of a blockchain network in the hands of the general public in the shape of Bitcoin. So from 2008, as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system to today, with borderless finance impacting in a massive fashion in 2024. Blockchain has arrived. And blockchain did come, see, and conquer. Thank you.